Okay, so today uh, we are going to talk a little bit uh, about fins, clarifying some of the stuff uh, that we've discussed over the last two weeks and hopefully firming up a few concepts that might have been uh, ambiguous when you guys were doing the homework. Um, and um, helping me with this presentation uh, will be a series of memes. So uh, originally, uh, I wanted to do a class on kind of a random but interesting topic. And I was thinking about doing something with internal heat generation. Um, we're going to save that for later because I think what you guys need most is a hardcore exam review. Uh, and as you guys saw, the exam has been shifted back, but it's still really important to firm up this stuff uh, before we uh, get into other topics. Uh, so um, thermal fits. Uh, basically, for any uh, constant cross-section thermal fin, the solution, the general solution, looks basically the same. Um, the issue is you get to this uh, ODE that has both a second derivative of theta and um, just a, a regular theta term. Um, and uh, just to recall that theta is essentially just delta T. It's the difference between the temperature at some point in the fin, whether that's the base or somewhere along x, uh, and the uh, temperature at t equals uh, uh, ambient, t equals infinity. Um, and then this m squared term is uh, simply um, h, the heat transfer coefficient, times the perimeter, which uh, for a circular cross-section fin is just uh, 2 pi r or pi d. Um, and for a uh, rectangular fin, it's twice the thickness plus twice the width. Uh, oh, sorry, and that's over the thermal conductivity times the AC, that's the cross-sectional area of the fin, whether you're measuring it um, as the thickness times the width or uh, pi d squared over four, or pi r squared for a circular fin. Uh, but basically, the critical thing to understand is that the exact geometry doesn't matter that much as long as you're uh, being consistent with how you track both the cross-sectional area and the perimeter. So most of you by now are familiar with this table from Incomprera. Um, it's pretty ugly, and uh, there's uh, kind of a lot of different options. And when in the homework, if we're not totally clear on, oh, this has to be modeled in such and such a way, you might be left scratching your head saying, I've got all these different equations, they're all really different, which one do I use? I imagine that this is the situation a lot of you guys find yourselves in. Do I choose the infinite fin or the adiabatic tip, or do I have to use the convective heat transfer uh, boundary layer, or uh, boundary? Um, just taking a look back at these uh, different cases again, I think my main goal for this YouTube video is to invoke that um, these are all different approximations, um, and in many cases, uh, if you um, can feel out the problem correctly, um, sometimes it really doesn't matter which one you use. But I think the critical thing is to understand when a uh, temperature distribution or a uh, uh, heat rate serves as an upper bound or a lower bound, and then understand the physics of uh, why these different kinds of boundary condi conditions would be setting different kinds of bounds. Um, so the most accurate of how an actual fin would you'd expect to behave generally is this convection heat transfer. It stands to reason that if you've got a fin uh, that there's convection along the entire length of the fin, why wouldn't there also be um, heat transfer uh, at the tip of the fin? The issue with that boundary condition is it gives rise to these really, really ugly expressions for the temperature distribution and the heat rate. Um, and that's the reason we've got cases B and D. Uh, we're mostly not going to talk about C right now uh, because we just haven't seen that much prescribed temperature, um, although it does uh, render a, a pretty usable um, heat rate and a pretty usable temperature distribution. So two different conditions, adiabatic and infinite fin. Um, the simplest is infinite fin, uh, so you're assuming that the fin just goes on forever, and what you find is that if the fin uh, were to be infinitely long, the heat rate wouldn't uh, go to infinity. You don't get infinite watts out of that. 
um, it actually converges on some finite value, and that value is exactly equal to the square root of HPKAC, again, that's cross-sectional area, uh, times theta B, which is really just your delta T, the difference between your base temperature and your ambient temperature. Um, the other term, uh, or so the, when we talk about adiabatic, uh, we're basically taking that term and then derating it. We're using a uh, hyperbolic tangent ML. Uh, hyperbolic tangent uh, covers the full domain, so anything from negative infinity to positive infinity, but is bounded between negative one and positive one. So if you plug in a positive value for ML, your hyperbolic tangent is going to, uh, that function is going to be somewhere between zero and one. So for finite length, you're going to get a uh, heat rate that's something less than if you had just looked at M by itself. Uh, and then the convection heat transfer coefficient is um, quite a bit more complicated. Um, but we, we'll look at some graphs and we'll kind of see how they all relate to each other. So the, the critical thing that I want to, uh, to convince you guys of is it's not a matter of using a, a more sophisticated uh, model is always better. So uh, you might have this idea that, well, the convective boundary condition is the most accurate, so uh, that's the one that we should be using all the time. It's really, you know, the real galaxy brain comes from knowing when it matters which model you use and when you can use just the simpler heuristics like an infinite thin or adiabatic tip assumption uh, when that is sufficient. Um, so the thing that I did for this video was I basically just plugged in a bunch of values, um, very standard values. We took H as 120, which I think was from one of the homework problems. Um, what, that's watts per meter squared Kelvin. Uh, thermal conductivity is 200 watts per meters Kelvin. That's typical of aluminum. I think most of the aluminum you've been using was 237, but it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, very thin, thin, uh, only five millimeters uh, thick. The width is five centimeters. Perimeters calculated from those two, areas calculated from those two. Your T inf is, uh, so your, your um, ambient temperature is uh, 30 degrees Celsius, so it's a little bit warmer than room temperature. Your base temperature is right at boiling, 100 Celsius. Um, and then everything else is just calculated based on the formulas given. So um, the first plot here is the heat rate versus thin length um, for each of these three models. So red is the convective boundary model. That's the, what we were calling kind of the most accurate. The adiabatic tip model is in green, and then the infinite thin model is in blue. And what we did here is that we just plugged in different values from F for L. L is 0, L is 0 0.01, up to 0 0.05, kind of, uh, making these nice smooth lines for all of them. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that the infinite thin model doesn't care about length. That makes sense because um, L doesn't actually appear in this anywhere, right? M is not a function of L. Um, and it, it, I mean, it shouldn't make sense if, if you had an infinite thin model that did depend on length, it wouldn't really be an infinite thin model. Um, the other thing that you probably notice is that your convective boundary and adiabatic tip models track pretty closely. Um, and that's, you know, when we tell you all the time, add, just use an adiabatic tip model. The reason is over a pretty wide domain, it is a very, very good approximation of this convective boundary model, uh, which, as I've said before, is really kind of technically um, the most accurate. Um, where does that fail? Um, it fails right uh, for very, very short fins. So right near L equals zero. Uh, and then we can think a little bit as, well, why should a convective boundary model be different than an adiabatic tip model there? It appears that the convective boundary model is reporting a slightly higher heat rate. So the way to think about that is if you took this fin here on the right and you shortened it, and you shortened it till it was almost not sticking out at all, um, there would be very, 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 very little heat transfer um, just off of the perimeter of the fin, off of the kind of outside area. Um, most of the heat transfer would be off of the tip, right? If you shortened it all the way to the zero, all of the heat transfer is off the tip, but the whole thing is just tip. And in fact, um, if you took the convective boundary um, 
heat rate and set L equals zero, this thing would actually simplify to H A delta T. So it would be exactly equal to the heat rate if there was no fin at all and you were just had heat going through um, an area of this size uh, that was set at the base temperature. Um, as you can imagine with the adiabatic tip model, it goes to zero because if you're saying that there's no heat coming through the tip and you're setting the length very close to zero, there's basically no opportunity for heat to escape anywhere. Um, so that is why um, they look like this. So yeah, that convergence point where the red line hits the y-axis, that's exactly equal just to uh, HAC delta T and uh, adiabatic tip converges at zero. So as you move along, they get very, very close together. And that's for two reasons. Uh, it's both relative, that as the fin gets longer, there's so much heat transfer coming off of the side of the fin that relatively speaking, the amount of heat transfer you've had off of the tip becomes smaller. Um, and it's also becoming smaller in absolute terms. It's kind of subtle, but you can see these lines actually are getting closer together. Um, and that's because as the fin gets longer, the temperature at the tip gets closer to ambient. So then there's, there's less heat, uh, a lower heat rate coming off the tip in the convective boundary model because that delta T is smaller and uh, area and H are still the same. So after you get to a certain length, they're really indistinguishable. And that's what we've been trying to communicate when we say, ah, just use adiabatic tip. It really is as good as this much, much, much more complicated model. So then this brings us to when is the infinite fin model good enough? Um, and I think uh, your problem four on the homework, there was really a split in the class. I think something like half of you got it and half of you didn't. And I want to clarify that now. The point of that problem was when does this adiabatic tip model get within 2%, you know, up to 98% up to of whatever the heat rate reported by the infinite fin model was? Um, and just before we go to that, I just want to point out on this slide that the infinite fin model is always going to be an upper bound, right? And you're derating it, you're, you're decreasing the heat rate when you apply um, either the convective boundary or adiabatic tip models. Um, and the adiabatic tip is going to be a lower bound. So if you compute the adiabatic tip and the infinite fin models, which you can do pretty quickly, that tells you, and they're close, then you know that the convective boundary model squeezed in between somewhere. I just, sorry, I just wanted to um, make sure that was established. Okay, so going into more detail on problem four from the homework, the question was, um, at what length uh, will the adiabatic model be within 2% of the infinite fin limit? Um, so a way of writing that mathematically is your Q fin, assuming an adiabatic tip, for some given length L equals 0 0.98 for Q fin infinite. And remember this Q fin infinite is just big M, right? Big M. Um, so you can rewrite it. Um, and uh, what we found out there was, uh, I think it was, um, you had a hyperbolic tangent, you had to invert that to the other side, and you end up with uh, the infinite fin limit is 2.29 square root HP over KAC or KAC over HP, something like that. Um, if you want more information on that, just look at the homework solutions. Um, that self-grading is not due until after the break. But that's basically what that problem was asking. It's the, the way to picture it is at what length along this x-axis is your adiabatic tip gonna be within 2% of the infinite fin limit. Um, and incidentally, we know that if the adiabatic tip models within 2% of the infinite fin li limit, so will the convective boundary model be, because your upper bound and your lower bound are converging. Um, so it tells us um, also how accurate it is. I think one of the points of this problem is, um, first of all, just to understand at what point is the added accuracy you get from modeling finite uh, fin length uh, unnecessary. You know, at what time do you, do you not actually get more accuracy from that? Um, and then also just to understand the utility of the infinite fin model, um, you can really quickly compute that big M. Um, and that tells you 
under the best scenario, you know, under the best conditions with the constraints you have, what is the highest heat rate you can get off of a fin of any length? So if you compute that and it's still not high enough, then no length fin is going to do it. Um, and realistically, most fins we want to keep pretty short. Um, so segueing right from that, that's where the concept of efficiency comes from. Um, I, I don't think there's a, a, a direct um, name for this ratio of, of your adiabatic uh, heat rate to your theoretical infinite heat rate, uh, infinite fin heat rate. Um, but generally speaking, as you increase L, you get closer to the infinite fin limit. Um, efficiency works differently. Efficiency compares your heat rate from your fin, um, whether that's modeled as adiabatic or convective or just measured off of an experimental fin, relative to what the heat rate would be if the entire fin were at constant temperature. Um, and the idea is uh, that sets, you know, assuming the whole fin is at a constant temperature, that sets an upper bound for what the theoretical maximum heat rate could be under some sort of idealized uh, conditions. Um, so if you, if you take this equation and we use the adiabatic tip model, this is all from the book, you get um, eta is tan H, hyperbolic tangent of ML over ML. Um, and then if we um, bring M up and you know, substitute in and flip it, we get uh, eta equals the square root of Ka over HP times tan H ML over L. Uh, this A, by the way, is still the cross-sectional area. Um, so it could be AC. So as I mentioned before, hyperbolic tangent is just um, when you're plugging in positive values, it's bounded between 0 and 1. So really, um, the meat of what's going on is in the square root Ka over HP term. Um, now, I suppose everything is, you know, this whole thing is bounded between 0 and 1. But I really want you to look at this, this first term, this coefficient. Um, and frankly, the L2, which is uh, in red. So what kinds of things can you do to improve fin efficiency, to make your fin better approximate this, this idealized fin where the whole surface is at infinite temperature? Or sorry, is at the base temperature? Um, one thing you can do is increase thermal conductivity. That makes sense, right? If we have a carbon steel fin that isn't doing the work that we need it to do, Maybe we can make it out of aluminum, which has a much higher thermal conductivity. We'll get a higher heat rate. Uh, you can increase the area. Um, of course, area and perimeter are fighting each other. But if you make the whole thing bigger, you're increasing the area more than you're uh, increasing the perimeter. Um, so um, broadly speaking, a bigger fin will do more work than a small fin. That makes sense, too. Now, the terms H and L are a little bit more interesting. So if we want to improve our fin efficiency, we can decrease our heat transfer coefficient. Uh, that's a little weird. Likewise, if we want to make the fin more efficient, we can make it shorter. That also should get you scratching your head. And the reason it should make you scratch your head is because this definition of uh, efficiency um, isn't really like other definitions that we use. Um, again, the whole thing is relative to your uh, constant temperature everywhere on the fin condition. Um, so you can improve your efficiency by making design improvements to, to your fin. You can also improve your efficiency by sabotaging your denominator. So if you make L shorter, uh, you get a lower fin efficiency. Or sorry, if you, make L, if you make L shorter, you get a higher fin efficiency, not because you've actually improved the heat rate coming out of your actual fin only because you've decreased the uh, heat rate from this theoretical perfect fin. Same exact thing with H. You would never, when designing a fin system, um, intentionally want to decrease your heat transfer coefficient. The whole reason you're putting in fins in the first place is because you have a heat transfer coefficient that isn't high enough and you're trying to increase your heat rate. But by decreasing your heat rate, you've decreased that temperature gradient along the fin. So the whole length of the fin is gonna be closer to the uh, base temperature. Um, so that's a little bit tricky. Um, I made a plot of this for you guys. Um, and this is using, actually not the adiabatic model, this is using the convective um, 
heat transfer model, convective tip model. So this is presumably the most accurate. Um, and what you see is for a very, very short fin, your efficiency is going to be very close to one because the temperature, there's not much of a temperature gradient along that length. The tip of the fin is very close to the base temperature. So essentially the whole fin is very, you know, is essentially as good as an idealization. Now very quickly as you increase the length of your fin, that efficiency, efficiency is going to drop off. Now what's happening is your heat rate from your fin is increasing. So lengthening the fin is always good for your heat rate, um, but your theoretical maximum is increasing more. So if you imagine going from this point to this point, that's 0.125 meters, so 12 and a half centimeters to 25 centimeters, when you've uh, doubled the length, you've doubled or roughly doubled the theoretical constant temperature heat rate. So the maximum um, imaginable um, cue that you could get from this fin if the whole thing were at the base temperature, you've only modestly increased your actual heat rate because that extra length you've added in uh, is doing less heat transfer than the first bit of length. Uh, and that's why your efficiency goes down. So just to compare these two plots, yeah, lengthening your fin always does improve your heat rate, but at a certain point, they're kind of diminishing returns on how much more heat rate you get out of it because you start approaching that infinite fin limit. Um, but also it decreases your efficiency, which is just a, kind of a metric. Um, I don't know exactly what the standards are for people who design fins in real life. I'm sure different industries have different standards but I can imagine people don't want to be going to the trouble of manufacturing things that are going to be very low efficiency. Um, and if you um, need to increase your heat rate and your fins are already only 50% efficient, you might try to do something else to improve uh, your heat rate rather than just lengthening your fin. Um, so then the last thing I wanted to talk about is the temperature profiles for different length fins. So um, these three plots are different lengths of fin. This is five centimeters, 10 centimeters, and 20 centimeters. The colors are the same, and we're using the equations back from that table. Uh, so it's the different set of equations, the temperature profile equations. So if we start on the right, what we see is that once the fin is pretty long, all these equations look really, really similar, at least up until the very end. Um, as you can imagine, as you go to shorter and shorter fins, this infinite fin model in particular really diverges. Um, why is that? And why is it lower? So it diverges and the temperature it suggests or it, it predicts is lower than your actual more accurate models. Because if you imagine this is a 10 centimeter long fin, this infinite fin model, that line wants to continue. So the infinite fin model imagines that there's way more aluminum that's just trying to suck heat down the uh, length of the fin. Um, but in the convective boundary model, when you get to that 10 centimeter point, all you have is convection, which is not um, as good at conducting the heat further down uh, than, um, uh, than if, if there were more fin continuing. Even more the case with the adiabatic. The adiabatic now is setting an upper bound for the temperature, whereas the infinite fin sets a lower bound for the temperature. Um, but with the adiabatic tip, there's no more heat rate at that point. So the temperature just kind of, sets, kind of gets stuck wherever it is. Um, but as you can imagine with the infinite fin, if you imagine that you have more aluminum or more whatever material trying to pull the heat down, that would decrease the, or, or steepen the temperature gradient, right? Because it would be um, more Q, steeper gradient. Uh, yeah, so that's the way to think about it. Um, even more severe when you look at um, the differences um, for an even shorter fin. So for a very short fin, um, and that's 0.05 lines up with here, which actually is not even that short, not compared to some of the stubbiest fins that we were looking at before. But that would be 
these heat rates. Um, your infinite thin temperature distribution is pretty lousy. Um, but your convective and adiabatic tip temperature conditions get, are still pretty close. So I think that's kind of the big takeaway from thinking about these models. I think the critical thing to know is that um, if this convection heat transfer is, we think, your most accurate model, understanding that for heat rate, your infinite fin sets an upper bound and your adiabatic tip sets a lower bound, and these are both much easier to compute. Um, and for your temperature distribution, uh, your infinite fin sets a lower bound of the temperature at any given point along the fin, and your uh, adiabatic tip sets an upper bound. Um, so if you compute these four things, um, you can probably avoid computing these two much bigger and uglier ones. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything that you guys need to understand on fins. Um, I know that we're planning on moving into other material uh, Thursday, but definitely try to feel really confident with this material before the exam, because I think a big part of the exam will be on fins. Um, so um, just to wrap up, um, I hope everybody is uh, taking all necessary precautions. It's going to be very interesting to see how things go online uh, over the next couple weeks. Um, but uh, I'm excited to be involved, and uh, I hope everybody has a great spring break.